flawless victory. Hello everyone and welcome to another top 10. Yes, I want to try and get these lists out more often. So in the future, I'm going to try and aim for one top 10 list a month and see how we go from there. If I can do more, I'll do more. And I will do other top 10 lists on other formats. Uh, the podcast might have the occasional top 10. And if you've noticed some of my uh, recent blog articles done for Zatu Games, uh, boardgame.co.uk, you will notice that I've done a couple of top 10s recently as well, like top 10 Cthulhu games and top 10 family holiday games, that sort of thing. But of course, as you know, I have my little Jotter book of things, which is essentially my little top 10 book. I've got all sorts of top 10 lists in here, some that I've uh, just come up with on the fly, some that have been requested, some I've done for panels. Not even all of them have been used on this format yet. Well, a, uh, a commenter on one of my videos asked if I could do a top 10 two-player games list. I did consider whether I wanted to make this a top 20. Unfortunately, when I actually did the list and came up with all the different two-player games, 20 was pushing it. I could maybe do 20, but to be honest, I think I'd rather keep this to a 10. And so it gave me a bit more tense decision-making with regards to narrowing it down to 10. So... Without further ado, let's get into it. These are my top 10 two-player games, with the caveat that they must strictly be two-player games. So if they've got solo mode or three or four players bolting onto it, does not count. It has to be a two-player game and nothing else, with one exception. Yeah, um, if the game is pretty much two players, but can go to four, and the only reason it goes to four is because you essentially split up what a two-player game has and distribute it among more players, that's fair game. Because let's face it, in all of those cases, I think most people agree that the two-player version dominates the three and four-player version. So they are looked on as two-player games, and I'm going to keep it that way. So let's make a start with my number 10. My number 10 barely made my top 100, literally scraped in at number 100. It is a two-player abstract game, and you're going to find there's a few abstract games on this list because I do like two-player abstracts. But this one is an unexpected surprise called Tack. Now, it, I don't know the history of it. It's based on some TV show. I don't watch it. Don't really care. And the theme, well, it's an abstract. There is no theme. But with Tack, you are trying to essentially build a path from your side of the board to the other. And you have pieces that you'll put down as like sort of flat paving slabs. But then your opponent's going to be doing the same thing. They can put up walls, which are like standing blocks in order to block you. And there's also a pawn piece which can essentially knock walls down. And, you know, you stack them on top of each other. It's a really neat little abstract game. And certainly one that gets you thinking. There's variable size boards. So you can play on this like mini 3x3 three three board. You can go as big as like 6x6, 7x7. And it's a decent two-player abstract. It's a bit tricky to get your head around it first with the various tactics. And certainly anybody who's played this regularly is going to wipe the floor with you if you're not careful. In fact, to be honest, they're going to wipe the floor with you anyway. But it's a decent two-player game. Takes about 30 minutes max, depending on how like engrossed you are in thinking about it. And you do get these nice chunky wooden blocks. So there's a... Certainly a lot in this box for you to sort of play around with from a tactile feel perspective. So, my number 10, tack. My number 9 is probably the most effective two-player trading card game that there is, and that is Jaipur. 
Jaipur you'll see on a lot of people's top 10 lists and essentially it's a back and forth game where you're collecting sets of cards that are based on silk and spices and cloth or whatever, you know, typical trading in the med style card game. But when you collect these sets, you'll take these tokens that are worth money and the first person to get them gets more money than the person who gets the sets later. So you're trying to meet the demand quicker than expected. There's also camels within the market that you can take, which allow you to substitute cards and give you a point bonus at the end. It's just straight up back and forth two player game. It's really fast, really easy to learn. The component quality is pretty solid as well. A little bit pricey for a two player game, but Jaipur, I really enjoy it. It's just very simple and it gets trading right. Because you've got to trade with that open market in the center, but you've got to think, well, if I trade these cards for those cards, I'm letting my opponent have access to these. Do I want them to have access to these? And even if I don't want to take the orange card, should I take it just to make sure my opponent doesn't get any more of it because I know they're collecting orange cards? There's a lot of thinking, but very simple mechanics. Best out of three rounds. Nice and quick. Very portable. Very popular. Jaipur, my number nine. My number eight is a two-player worker placement game. Yeah, there's not many of those, is there? Nah, but in this case, there is. Now, with this one, you've probably already guessed what it is, and that is Targi. Targi is a great two-player worker placement game where you are trying to claim these cards that give you points at the end of the game or give you certain resources. And what happens is that around this grid of cards, there is another set of action cards that you will place your worker on. To begin with, they don't do anything. But what you're trying to do is to intersect the workers with the grid itself. So say I want the card in the middle, I want to place worker there, worker there, they interlink on the grid, that's the card I'm taking. The problem is though, is that where you place your worker on a row or column, the opponent cannot place a worker that looks directly at it. So you are constantly fighting back and forth, trying to get the cards you want, whilst also blocking the opponent from getting the cards they want. It's very tense, it can be quite mean and cutthroat, but it's definitely a very thinky two-player game that needs a bit more buzz. I think it needs a reprint. It needs to come back into like common ground and be played more because I really do enjoy this one. The only problem I have and the reason why it doesn't really go higher on the list is that it requires you to teach a fair bit of the game to someone else and obviously you know, it's quite a thinky game for someone to just come in randomly and new. I certainly wouldn't teach this as a gateway game. Definitely one for gamers. But, two player worker placement game in a small box. Can't really beat it. That's Targi, my number eight. My number seven, and we're back to abstracts. And this uses the mechanic that I like to call opponent control. It's where your move dictates what the opponent can do. And you'll see another example of this on the list later on, spoiler alert. But this is the one that really does it down to a T, and that is Camisado. And most people haven't heard of this abstract game, which is a shame because it's, granted, it's not the cheapest in the world and it comes in a big box, but that's because you have a row of these pillars or castles that look like the castle piece in chess or similar enough. And they're huge, chunky with a felt bottom and colored with etched designs on it. They look gorgeous. It is very nice component wise. And you have a weird sort of color square board. But what you do is that the premise is very simple. Get your castle pillar to the opponent's side. Sounds simple enough. Your castles, however, can only move forwards, whether it's diagonal or in a straight line. Okay, sounds simple enough. Where's the catch? The catch is when you move a pillar, the color square that you move it to dictates the color of the pillar. I'm sorry, I'm saying pillar. Pillar, castle, tower, you know what I mean. It dictates the color of the tower that your opponent can move. So if I move to a pink square, they can only move their pink tower. Their pink tower moves to a green square. I can only move my green tower. So you can bait your opponent and goad them to go where you need to. And the more that the board gets clogged up with the towers and they get blocked off, the less choice you have, which means you try to lead your opponent to go on the colors that you want them to. Oh, it is definitely quite a thinky, but very simple abstract game. But what I love with this is that it gives you that mentality of realization that your opponent beat you, 
because you gave him the move to beat you with. I lost because I allowed my opponent to move their yellow tower which got it to my line. Who do I blame? Partially them, but mostly me because I'm the one that gave them the move that allowed them to do it. It's a cool mechanic and underrated you know, abstract game in my opinion. I think this one needs more buzz, great components, great simple premise, very thinky. Kamasado deserved number seven. My number six, you could argue it's mostly an abstract game, but there's a decent little amount of theme that comes out as people role play it and just sort of ham it up a little bit. And that is a very popular game from Bruno Kafala and for duty, Raptor. Raptor is a two player game where one player takes on the scientists and one player takes on the mother raptor and her babies. The scientists are trying to capture the babies to perform very safe experiments on them, you know, a la Jurassic Park style. And the mother raptor is trying to get the babies to safety. And if she eats a few scientists along the way, well then, hey, she hasn't eaten. Mother's got to eat. So what happens is that it's a back and forth game on this map. It's a variable map. And you have cards numbered from one to nine that give you special actions. But the cool thing with this is that you'll have three cards at once and you will simultaneously play them face down. You'll flip them over and then you compare the two numbers. Whoever played the lowest number gets to do the special action on the card. Whoever played the highest number gets the difference in values in action points to spend on doing various things like move, eat scientists, wake up babies, put mother raptor to sleep, you know, that kind of thing. And that mechanic just works so well. I admit that I think the scientists are a bit easier to win with in this game. I have certainly had a lot more scientist victories than I have raptor victories. I think the raptor requires a bit more finesse, but it's still enjoyable. You know, if I'm teaching this to new people, I tend to give them the scientists and see if I can win as a challenge with the raptor. But I love that simultaneous card play because you're getting into your opponent's head thinking, ah, oh, they've, they've already played their five and six. Knowing what actions they can do, are they gonna play high or low? If I play high, I need to have a lot of action points, but I'm letting them have that action. Maybe I should try and be as close as possible, but you know, have the lowest card. So I play my four, for example, and they play their five. I get a special ability, they get a measly one action point. There's a lot of that thinking that goes on and it's a great, tense, tactical game. Very, you know, components are so-so, but it looks nice on the board. The board is variable, you know, you've got blocking terrain that will change depending which way you orient the tiles. You get little funky little miniatures for your scientists and the raptor. And you just sort of ham it up with the theme. You know, I get immersed in trying to protect my lovely little babies whilst om nom nomming on a few scientists here and there. It's great fun. Love the card play. It's an, another one of those underrated hits that just sadly doesn't seem to get much more love these days. It came out with a bit of buzz, but I just don't see it around anymore. Give this one a try. Raptor, my number six. Now we're on to my number five, and again, we're on to an abstract game. Yes, you're gonna see a fair few of them on this list, but I really do like two-player abstract games. They make you think, they're cool little puzzles, they're short, and they go by this premise that it takes about five seconds to teach the game, but a lifetime to master it. All right, not obviously a master, but seriously, they to have something that you can teach in next to no time, but makes you think, works with me with abstracts. And this is one of my favorites. Yinch. Now Chris Brown has done a series of these games. They call them the GIF series, the GIF project. And they're called these weird names that don't make any grammatical sense whatsoever. You've got like Devan and Zar and Punked and all this weirdness. And it's a series of abstracts to player that use various different you know concepts we're familiar with, like stacking movement, five in a row, that sort of thing. And they're generally all good fun to play. I only own one though because two players are hard for me to get to the table and this is my personal pick of the whole series, and that is Yinch. With Yinch, it's that five in a row thing. Each of you has these uh, black and white discs, and you'll put them on the board in this sort of kind of, it's kind of like this uh, grid hex layout, you know, you've got the lines with the intersecting points, and you'll put these discs out there on those lines. The idea is that you're trying to get five of yours in a row of your color, white or black. Sounds simple enough. You have these rings that go on the board as well and you will move them through the connecting line, so you know, straight line all the way. 
And the idea is, is that you want to try and get the tiles to match your color five in a row. But what happens is every time a ring passes over these various tiles, they flip to the opposite side. So there is a ton of spatial awareness you need to be aware of here because you might flip a row of three black and two white to three white and two black. And the rings will be passing all over the place and flipping tiles over. It's very thinky, very tactical, but you can get some strategic play in there as well. There's a lot going for this one. And again, I can teach you the rules for this in five seconds. Granted, I didn't do a great job of explaining it just then. It's a bit easier when you've got the board to see it. Hopefully the pictures are helping on that respect. But yeah, really enjoy this one. It really gets you thinking. It looks gorgeous on the table because you've got the sort of black and white with a bit of blue. It's very stark looking, you know, but it stands out nicely. And the pieces are all these lovely little glossy baked light type pieces. They're very good quality. For an abstract, it looks the business and feels it. And definitely for this publisher and for this, like, you know, this uh, series, this is definitely my pick of the entire gift project. My number five, Yinch. My number four is the largest two player game I have by far. This one dwarfs all my other two player games in terms of size, scope, and components. It's one of those ones that I mentioned the caveat earlier for, where predominantly it's a two player game and everybody plays this as a two player game. If you have more than two players, you know, up to four, all you do is take whatever the two player guy has and split it between two people. Boring, nobody wants to do that. This is how you should play it, just straight up two players. It is Star Wars in a box and it is really heavy. And it is Star Wars Rebellion. You want Star Wars theme? Grab this, pure and simple. This is one of the most thematic Star Wars games I have ever played. One player being the Empire, one player being the Rebellion. Each is asymmetrical in how they play. The Empire is trying to find out where the Rebel base is and blow it up. The Rebel player is trying to last long enough by gaining reputation in different symbols, performing hit and run tactics on the Empire to sort of last out a game timer that um, you know kind of works depending on how well the Rebellion is doing. So the Empire definitely has a leg up on the Rebellion in terms of actual firepower in units. So the Rebellion has to be more crafty and deal with subterfuge. Both sides are great fun to play though. It's certainly very heavy and certainly very long. You're talking two to three hours easily, if not more for this game. But when you play it, my God, it feels so nice. And the expansion that I reviewed recently, Rise of the Empire, I think it was, has improved this even more because now you've got all the stuff from Rogue One to put in, you've got more variety, and you have this new sort of tactics combat deck that streamlines the combat a lot more because that was one of the flaws in the base set. The combat was a little bit clunky and it didn't quite feel right by the expansion. Combat is sorted, so this has just gotten better in my books, in my opinion. I wish I could get it to the table more often though because two player games are hard enough to get to the table as it is, let alone when they're like three hours long, but Whenever I can, whenever it's an event that I can get this to the table, I love it. If they can ever make a solo mode for this, that would be fantastic. I don't quite know how on earth you'd manage to do that, but hey, they can try. But even then, two players, Star Wars in the box. Yeah, I want this. No questions asked. My number four, Star Wars Rebellion. My number three is a kind of a, a sister or brother, however you want to call it, to Camisado that I mentioned earlier. When I was talking about opponent control, where what you do is going to dictate what the opponent does. It is a simple two player abstract game and in the Dice Tower Essentials line. And it is a quality product. And it is the very simple, if I can get it behind me, Oni, whoa, Onitama. Onitama comes in a cool little box. And it's very straightforward. It's basically like a mini game of chess where you have your five pieces for students and the master and each of you has two cards in front of them and one in the middle. So five cards out of a potential something like 14 or 16 in the base set, more so with the expansion. And the idea is, is that the cards tell you how the pieces move. So, for example, one that's, they're all based on martial arts style. So one saying crane might have your piece move 
forwards, backwards, left or right. So no diagonals and no jumping, you know, for example. All the cards have got various different inversions and reflections of different types of movement. And the idea is, is that when you use a card, your piece will move and then it swaps with the one in the middle. So the idea is, is that a turn later, your opponent is gonna have access to the card you just used. Did you want them to have access to that? Would you have preferred to hang on to it because you think it will give them too much uh, maneuverability? And that decision is constantly back and forth and all you need is five cards. The variety in this game is just astounding. And again, I can teach you this in less than a minute. We can get playing 15 minutes of pure fun, pure abstract chess-like fun. If you want chess, but you don't want that whole like long strategic version, this is essentially what will scratch that chess itch for you. There are two ways to win. You either take your opponent's master, a la checkmate in a sense, or you get your master on the opponent's seat. So two different ways to win, multiple cards to use, and just that constant, do I want my opponent to get that card? Which one? I'm gonna get that card in a minute. Hopefully he'll use that one. Do I wanna give him the uh, Mantis? I don't know, I might wanna hang on to it. You know, all that thinking going on in a box, which is pretty easily portable, granted, I think that this could have had a bit of a cheaper price point. I mean, they gave you a fancy box. That's a, uh, um, where is the uh, opening to this? I can find it. I can figure this out. Yeah, here we go, like sort of magnetic box lid that opens out with a cool neoprene mat in it. The expansion was done in a similar box, which really didn't need to. It could have literally just put the cards in a polythene bag and given it to you. So it's a little overproduced from the box and that's what's made the price point a bit, in my opinion, but Definitely worth the money because you will get more than your money's worth in value playing this excellent abstract game. And I believe, yes, well, you can call these other ones abstract maybe theme-wise, but this is the last proper pure abstract game on the list. Onitama, a stupendous number three. Now, this one was really hard. I mean, my number one and number two, I was like, oh, which one do I like more? I don't know. It was so hard to place my one and two at different ends. And, but eventually, I've got to. It's a top ten after all, otherwise it kind of defeats the point. This one, though, I have been bringing to nearly every game night I have since probably when I got it, which was about last month. I haven't even had this game for that long, but it's had a lot of plays, and I've enjoyed just watching people play it because the tactical decisions that you have to make with the cards in this game is just amazing. All I heard about it at first was Sam Healy bleating on about it on various Dice Tower shows. He even put it as high as number 13 in his top 100. And this is a two player micro game. For Sam, that's saying something. But I gotta agree. Hannah Mikoji, yeah, he pronounced it properly this time I hope, is just that solid. This is one of the best, if not the best, micro game I have ever played. It's a solid two player where you are trying to win favor over geisha cards. And you do this by collecting items respected to them. So like teapots, flutes, lutes, fans, whatever. You know, if you know what a geisha is, you'll know what I'm on about. And the idea is, is that you have four actions you can do in a round, but you choose which order you do them in and you must do all four. So one of them will be scrap two cards out of the round. Another one might be store a card for later. Another one will be put three cards down, your opponent picks one, you get the other two. So the four actions are very straightforward, but there's a lot of I pick you choose mechanic wise for your opponent. And obviously they've got the same four actions. So you're gonna get to pick and choose from their ones as well. But each of you has a little bit of hidden information from the other player like, You've got your hand of cards and based on what's on the table, you'll be making decisions It's like, oh, should I do that action now? I could give him these cards. Maybe I can goad him into picking these ones, thinking he's gonna win the majority on that geisha. It's just so solid. And it's one of those games that you've just got to try. You have to try it. It looks beautiful, the artwork is astounding, the card quality is decent. I mean, I've sleeved mine, not that many cards to sleeve. And it's such a small game. Doesn't take long to teach. I can teach this one in a couple of minutes, no problem. And you'll have 15 to 20 minutes of solid fun. It's just so good. This game has put Emperor S4 on the map for me because I haven't tried any of their other games. I've heard of Honshu. I've been told it's pretty good. 
I want to try it now. And I want to try all their other games now because they're, they're, they're anywhere as good as this. Then this is a publisher you should be keeping an eye on. Two player micro game, Hanami Koji, absolutely astounding game. I think I've rated this a 10 alongside my number one, of course. It's just so good, definitely worth picking up. However, one game had to beat this. Which one was it? My number one is based off a very popular drafting game. And yes, some of you have probably called this if you've been paying attention to my top 100. It was so difficult to put this one alongside Hanuma Koji because I really enjoy both of them. This one is definitely a lot more complex and requires you to have played the uh, base game that it's well, the game that it's based on in order to have a decent understanding of it. But when I teach this one, I get a big kick out of it. When I play this with someone who knows what they're doing, it's one of the most tactical, tense, and enjoyable two-player experiences that I have come across. More so even than Hanuma Koji. And even that, like I say, I was a 10 out of 10 game. This is a 10 out of 10 game. It is based off the great Seven Wonders. And yes, of course, it is Seven Wonders Duel. This one is just a great game, with or without the expansion. I have the Pantheon expansion in here, and I like to use it. I think it was a decent expansion. Not essential, but it was really good. But I will happily bring this out and just teach the base game to someone, and I will still enjoy it. But when you play this with someone who knows what they're doing, the decisions back and forth are great. You've got the two alternate victory conditions of you know, mass military and collecting all the science cards as before. So even though that you may get to the point where you will total up points, you can't ignore those two other victory conditions. Because if you do, your opponent's going to exploit them and they might win by some underhanded method. The way that the cards are laid out where you've got to think, Oh, if I choose that card, then I'm going to reveal some unknown cards to the opponent. It might be something they really like. Really cool back and forth turn system. The Wonders give you lots of cool abilities. And again, they're varied every round. And the Pantheon expansion has elevated this up for me because it allows you to utilize these God cards, which require money, but they give you a special bonus when you do. And it progresses throughout the game. The first round, you'll collect the offering tokens where you'll be able to select what gods there are. And then in the second round, you'll be able to get stuff that discounts how much they're worth. And then later on, you'll actually start using those gods. So it's a really cool progressive system. But it also allows you to mess up the turn order. Because normally it's you take a card, then you take a card, then I take a card, then you take a card. Whatever you use it for, it doesn't matter. It's constantly, I take a card, you take a card. Well, with the Pantheon expansion, you can actually turn that on its head and say, you know what, I'm not going to take a card. I'm going to spend some money and I'm going to use that god. I'm going to use Ares, God of War, whatever, and take this bonus. Now it's your turn. Oh, what's the matter? You can't afford a god card? Right, you take that card then that I didn't want. There you go. Oh, look, you revealed some nice stuff for me. You know, it's, it brings in an entirely new tactical layer to this game. Now, granted, I can't play this with everybody. I mean, if you have not played Seven Wonders, this one is going to be quite tricky to get your head around because of all the iconography. It really does help if you've played Seven Wonders. Even just the base Seven Wonders. You don't have to have played all the expansions. Just the base will do. But otherwise, you're going to have to teach them a whole new set of iconography and a whole new style of play. But uh, when you find the right people to play this with, and most people I know have played Seven Wonders, so it's usually quite easy for me to find somebody who's at least familiar with the concept of how Seven Wonders works. It can lead to some amazing two-player experiences. And as I said with Hana and Nikoji, these two were really hard to place. These two are easily my two favorite two-player games. Whichever one you like, doesn't matter. You are in with a solid time. So Seven Wonders Duel is my number one. And that concludes my top 10 two-player games. If I was to go to 20, I'd be mentioning other great titles such as, let's have a look here, uh, Patchwork, solid two-player Tetris-style game. I prefer Baron Park, though. Uh, Pentago, a really cool two-player abstract game with twisting sort of five-in-a-row style me mechanics. Uh, Mijin Leaf, uh, the little bag behind me here. Another cool abstract. Like I say, I like abstract games. Uh, Tatsu, behind my back. 
Two-player abstract again, similar to Backgammon with, you know, cool dragon tiles and dice movement. You know, like I say, I like the abstracts. It doesn't always have to be a thematic game with me, okay? People take note. Uh, Agricola, all creatures big and small. Great two-player version of Agricola with a bit more of a simplified concept. Uh, Star Realms slash Hero Realms, entertaining deck builder. Magic the Gathering, can't forget the classics. Granted, I only want to play it with starter decks, but, you know, still fun when you get to. Dice Masters, Pixel Tactics, Summon the Wars, Rivals of Catan, Android Netrunner, Chess, the normal Chess, uh, Hive. It, this, uh, is there anything else? Nope, that's pretty much it. And in case some of you are wondering, well, where's Fields of Arl? You really like that game, Luke. Well, Fields of Arl can be played solo, so I didn't count that for my list. And there's an expansion coming out that's going to elevate it to three players, so it's no longer a two-player game, really. So that one didn't make the cut. But yeah, so many cool two-player games. Any of the ten that I have mentioned on this list, I love and would happily play in a heartbeat. And most two-player games I enjoy anyway. I just wish I could get into the table more often. I live alone. It doesn't help. Most of the time when I go to uh, game groups, there's a big group of us. Therefore, we're not playing two-player games. I have to invite someone specifically around my house to get these two-player games out unless I turn up, say, early for a group night and while we're waiting for people to arrive, I say, you know what, can we just get this two-player game out while we wait? And that tends to work. Star Wars Rebellion is even harder, though. That three-hour monstrosity, that's definitely an event one. But two-player games can be some of the most enjoyable gaming experiences ever because it's just your wits against your opponent. Mano a mano, you versus one person, Back and forth, great strategic and tactical play. And there's a lot of two-player games I haven't even played. I really want to play, uh, I've, I've tried it, but I haven't had enough time with Tides of Madness, for example. Tides of Time, Tides of Madness, whichever one. But I really want to try that more. Uh, Babel, I've heard that's a really mean two-player game. I would like to try it more. You know, um, other ones I haven't mentioned, Battle Lore, that was a cool two-player like miniature game. Uh, the Star Wars Imperial Assault two-player skirmish mode, again, Really good game. There's so many two players out there. And old and new, I haven't tried them all. But these ones, whew, they are some beauties. I love these 10 that I've mentioned. Hopefully you will too. So that's it for me on this top 10, my top 10 two player games. Hope you've enjoyed the list. Subscribe to the channel if you like what you see. Feel free to make comments and make suggestions. Tell me what your favorite two players are. Tell me what you'd like to see on the top 10s, what you'd like to see on the reviews. And if you get a man it, then please subscribe to my Patreon campaign as well. So that's it for me. I'll see you on the next episode of The Broken Meeple. For now, enjoy your two-player game. But just remember, it doesn't matter how much you're beaten down by your opponent. It's still only a game. So just enjoy it and have fun. See you soon, guys. <laughs>